Copilot, last time you heard from us, we released our virtual production short film, Imagine. A huge part of this process was the sound design. Sure, we could have done it, but why not go to professional and summon... The dark arts of sound design. <laughs> Meet Dimitri. This project just started sounding a whole lot better. Whoa, 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 let's back up. If you haven't watched Imagine yet, this video is going to make a lot more sense if you do. In virtual production, you can go two ways. Either realistic backdrop that simulates reality, or fantastical place that elevates reality. In Imagine, we did a little bit of both. But how does virtual production change the way sound design is done? There is only one way to find out. Get a pro sound designer like Dimitri to answer all of my burning questions. Question 1. How does sound design for virtual production differ from regular sound design? Let's jump in. Basically an imaginary world, so it would be the same as designing for like a cartoon, let's say. So a lot of it's um, like we see only a portion of the scene, so we have to fill in the rest, right? So whether it's ambience, sound effects, folly, all kinds of things, so we try and fill it out to give this sort of immersion quality to the to the video. Right? Question two, is this your first time sound designing a virtual production project? Yeah, no, definitely a first time. And I mean, I, I was happy to see that this new technology, like I wasn't, I wasn't aware that it even exists, right? So a lot of times when you just assume it's a green screen, right? And then yeah. uh, to see that it's an actual environment and that she's actually standing in front of a canyon, you know, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. It, it, it's really cool. Question three, do you think virtual production gives sound designers more creative liberty? You know, sound designers have been working with animation f for ages. Here, the environment is so realistic and the actor is so involved in it that uh, whatever s sound we add on top of that, it's just bringing it so much closer to reality. If we're working in virtual and we're trying to make like a, a photo real scene of a, of a known place, that's where sound design can also help like make it seem normal even you know because you're creating it out of a known like even uh, the environment of a canyon right you already know how it's supposed to sound so creating it and bringing it to life it's it's even makes it so much more fun because we are here we see what's going on it's lit literally becomes like logical at that point right question four how do you see virtual production simplify the sound designers on set process that's why libraries come into play huge here. Not only do they save a bunch of time, a bunch of money, right? They do give you that creative liberty. You can jump between different recordings and you can select what's best, right? Question five. Can you walk us through some of the sounds you designed for Imagine? The main sort of character in, the, in this short film would be the cube, right? The cube itself has a sort of a lightsaber kind of quality to it and um, when she picks it up and as you can hear that as she's manipulating it the, the cube is kind of releasing the sound. It's like it's got like gravitational properties to it, you know what I mean? Like So by itself the, the recording of the synth itself is, uh, is, is pretty cool already. When I first heard that glassy sound, that was like, I would have never put those two together, but when her fingertips are touching this like powerful object and that glassy sound kind of cracks along it, it totally makes sense. The first time she interacts with it, when she picks it up, we don't know what it's made of. That's just a coffee cup. I think I mentioned earlier. So that's literally just a recording of a coffee cup. And because ceramic has more weight to it, right? So we can actually hear that it's a ceramic. And you hear that ring. As opposed to glass. I love those big hits. When I listen to it, it sounds like you're adjusting the settings of the cube and then it just like releases. Sort of a like a broken ship. You know when you see in movies when they show like a, a sinking ship or something like that, there's this totally. metallic clank to it, right? Final question. When you began to approach our project, where'd you start? So originally, actually, I started just 
with clicks and cranks, ended up not using it. It sounded too too rattly, too toyish. Right. Actually, the, the clicks and clanks are a little bit too mechanical and we need this to have more power. So that that's when I started to think, okay, well, I need to design the drone first. So, and that's what we talked about originally is that the, it has to have some sort of a low drone, right? And mm -hmm. I wasn't sure how to approach it at first. Would it be a constant drone? Would it be, you know, uh, just in and out every once in a while? And that's how I achieved this, this low, uh, sort of a higher sound. Thanks for watching, everybody. And if you haven't checked out our virtual production playlist, it's got a ton of content just for you. Dimitri, where can these people find you? What what can they, <laughs> what do you got going on in your life right now that they need to know about? Well, I, I also make music, so I write electronic music. So you can find me under the artist name Clones or Gemini Clones is another uh, artist name. You can find me under my name, Dmitry Belichenko, on Spotify, and um, I also sell music to license on Shockwave Sound, so you can find me, or you can just Google my name, and check out my website, yeah, check out what I'm up to. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. This has been Josh. You're watching Copilot. See you in the next one.